Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to this week's hottest seminar. Uh, if you're watching this live, congratulations on uh, successfully navigating the uh, changing time zones. Uh, but today we have uh, Daniel Greitzer, who will be telling us about modalities and weak dependent right adjoints. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the intro and thank you to the host for having me. So yes, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, modalities and modal type theory. And uh, I think the proper place to start is with uh, type theory with no modalities. So let's, uh, let's, let's discuss a bit what we want to preserve as we start to tweak type theory. And to me, sort of the heart of type theory that I want to carry forward is the fact that type theory does a good job of working with families of objects compared to just single objects. And really what this stems from is the fact that everything in type theory happens relative to a context. But that context is completely silent. When you're working in Agda, you don't manually keep track of all the variables in scope. You just use the ones that you want, and you don't use the ones that you don't want. And the thing that makes this actually hang together is the fact that every connective in type theory, everything you can write down, is suitably natural in the context. The substitutions will ripple through, and they'll sort of silently uh, resolve themselves on variables without any intervention from you. And this is, this is quite nice for working with families of objects, because it means that rather than working with a, a single widget versus a family of widgets, you can always just work with a single widget and change the context that you're working in. But I, I want to emphasize that having this naturality in the context is quite crucial to making this work. And so I have a, a sort of hyperbolic example of what goes wrong without this naturality. So you, you imagine that we have a, a term phi of type uh, for all, and there exists some m such that da 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 da. And if we actually instantiate this with, uh, let's say, two, it's rather important that the term that we get out has the type, there exists some natural number such that, da, 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 da. Uh, without this, it would be completely unworkable to, uh, to sort of work within a proof assistant. Anytime we use a lemma in a different context, which is every time we use a lemma, we'd be completely stuck. And we would have to sort of manually inspect that the shape of our lemma has not uh, changed under our feet. So in particular, it would be quite catastrophic if uh, when we instantiated this lemma, somehow the, the natural became a Boolean. And while, of course, it's sort of hard to imagine that this happens, there is a precise technical reason why it doesn't happen. And it's this naturality condition that I was talking about. So I, I've written up one instance of these sort of uh, equations that we expect to hold, the ones for uh, dependent sums. And it says that if you hit a dependent sum with a substitution gamma, then this substitution passes through the dependent sum to act on the first and second component on A and on B. And while the, the substitution uh, may change as we descend, notice that for uh, acting on B, it uh, extends itself by a variable, things like this. The important bit is that any time we apply a substitution, we are able to push it through and still preserve this sigma type. And uh, I've written it here with explicit substitutions. This is a, a personal preference. Of course, you can express this with uh, admissibilities instead of derivabilities with uh, sort of external substitutions or in any other number of formulations. The really important bit is that our type theory validates this principle somehow. Substitutions have to flow past connectives without disturbing them. And with that in mind, I can uh, say what I want to say about modal type theories. So the central goal of modal type theories is to construct a type theory with a connective, a, a modality, which doesn't satisfy this property. So the whole point is to take this very nice property, everything commutes with substitution, and completely disrupt it, and then attempt to sort of wiggle our way back to something that's kind of usable. So trying to make a usable system out of what remains. And I know that usability is a, a very squishy sort of goal, but I'll, I'll sort of have two benchmarks, which is I really want whatever we end up with to be implementable. I want Agda with modal types. And sort of this, this imposes a few constraints. I need decidable type checking. And in practice, that means that I need normalization. And the resultant formalism should be usable, I, I should be able to actually prove things with it. Again, it's squishy, but these two goals are worth keeping in mind. And I, I think it's quite nice to actually have a few examples of modalities that we might care about. So let, let's start by, uh, by talking about a few instances that make the pain worth it. So um, one, one particularly nice example, I think, starts with this line of work by Orton and Pitts, using the internal language of cubicle sets to construct models of cubicle type theory. And the observation there is that when you work within the internal language, the, the intricate part of constructing a model of cubicle type theory, uh, which is resolving these or constructing these vibrancy structures, these can be sort of rendered as programming exercises in type theory. And you can use uh, Agda or something else to help you make sure that you've gotten all the details right. 
this this lends itself to quite slick proofs for the existence of uh, models of cubical type theory for all the connectives except the universe where it sort of doesn't work and the reason why it doesn't work is uh, something that we can sort of crystallize in order to define the structure that we want upon the universe we need the ability to uh take advantage of the tininess of the interval namely that exponentiating by the interval has a right adjoint so we want both the adjunction and of course this right adjoint to be accessible to us within the internal language however they don't internalize um the the right adjoint doesn't descend to slices so it doesn't induce a map from types to types we can't just include it as a type former so this this led to a follow-up piece of work which didn't directly add this uh, so-called amazing right adjoint rather what it did is it added a constant which went from box u to u where box represents this idempotent comonet corresponding to the global section of the type sort of the closed terms if, uh, to a very coarse approximation now neither box nor the amazing right adjoint can be added directly but when you add box you are able to add the amazing right adjoint and then with that you're able to actually construct the desired structure upon the universe so quite quite slick and uh the other example is closer to my own research but correspondingly farther away from uh, homotopy type theory so you know you win some lose some and uh, a lot of my research centers around uh, guarded recursion and this is a very computer science sort of thing it's uh gives us a synthetic form of domain theory which is quite useful for uh, studying very recursive constructs that actually arise in programming languages and the the key primitives that uh, form guarded recursion in synthetic guarded domain theory are this later modality and the corresponding induction principle uh, the love induction principle which gives you almost a fixed point operator except the later guards the recursive instance and precludes all this nasty unsound uh, behavior so with this we can do quite a lot but it's not quite enough on its own uh, in particular all the properties that we want to express that have to do with liveness sort of adequacy termination these sort of things they're out of reach with just this set of primitives but once again we can kind of rectify the situation by adding another modality the, again uh, box together with an equivalence and uh, this is sort of um, a nice example of something we want run across quite a bit which is that one modality is good but two modalities or more is often better and in a situation where you have multiple modalities you often want them to interact in certain ways so here we want box later a to be equivalent to box a so now that unfortunately we might conclude that modalities are uh, quite useful we have to figure out how we're going to about, go about including them into our type theory and um the the answer is uh, essentially through through violence will alter context and substitutions so that the modalities are natural with respect to substitutions after changing the parameters of the game and the result is going to be a slightly odd and handcrafted type theory but it will have the modality and it will have some substitution mama. and that's that's sort of good enough to get going um, and we've been doing this for a long time now about uh, 25 years depending on how you start counting and the result is that we have roughly 25 years worth of alterations to type theory um and they're they're all sort of good for different situations they're a little bit incomparable and the, the result is kind of a, a mess of different modal type theories and so the goal of this talk is to sort of survey a few of the more common alterations to make and uh, in so doing we, we have to discuss their semantics a bit this is kind of necessary to understand what the point of these modal type theories is and I'd like to make the argument that the modalities that we run across in nature tend to lend themselves to being viewed as so-called weak dependent right adjoints and so I'm I'm hoping to convince you in this talk that well weak dependent right adjoints might be not be particularly nice to work with they they have uh, some some prominent place within what we know how to do currently and uh, before we get into it I want to lower expectations a bit uh, I have no intention of talking about substructural theory so this this is sort of another axis that uh, people consider when talking about uh, different type theories extending them with operators that don't respect the structural rules and I'm also going to assume that the modalities that we're considering are lex um, for some definition of lex here but I won't assume that they're fibered so that the sort of non-triviality comes in the last point that we won't assume that they induce maps on the universe but we're going to at least assume they're lex all right straight into it then so if we assume that everything is lex this sort of lends itself to a bunch of rules right off the bat that we can sort of throw together and so the first one is this sort of functorial formation rule which says that uh, if you have a type a in context gamma well you can form a type f of a in context f gamma 
So here's the, uh, the place where we've done some violence to the context and substitutions. We've extended our theory of context with a new context formation, uh, F of a context, and we'll extend our substitutions likewise with a sort of functorial action. So basically we, we add a functor to the category of context. And we'll require that FA have a limited sort of substitution principle. Namely, if you, uh, if you hit FA with a substitution under F, then things commute. This is, again, sort of expressing the functoriality of F. And the fact that it's Lex comes into the fact that it preserves context extension and the terminal context. So this is sort of a, a bare bones set of rules, but it has a major advantage. It's really easy to construct models of this. And uh, I've given one particular machine for spitting out models of this, uh, which is that if you have a display map category, so you have uh, distinguished maps which represent type families, you have a functor which preserves display maps, sends types to types, and pullbacks along them, then you can interpret all the above rules. And sort of you want to preserve display maps so that you can interpret this rule, the, uh, the functorial formation rule, and uh, preserving context extension is equivalent to preserving pullback along display maps. So in the common case, everything is a display map and your functor is just lex. Oh, I have a missing condition. Of course, we also wanted to preserve the, uh, the terminal object. All right, and uh, I'll note that I haven't really specified how you build any elements of F of A, um, but it turns out that it follows from the rules that we have modifying context. And it's, it's instructive to think about this. So if you suppose that we have a term M colon A, the context gamma, we can build the extended substitution, which goes from gamma to gamma dot A. And then we hit that with F. We now have a substitution which goes from F gamma to F gamma dot A. And we use our isomorphism that F preserves context extension. We go from F gamma to F gamma dot F A. And uh, the fact that uh, this isomorphism respects weakening means that this lives as a section. And so we can use the variable rule and thereby produce a term with the desired type. So in fact, this, this also gives us a functorial introduction rule. And the elimination rule can be form formulated in sort of the way you expect. But before we get too far into this, there is a major deficiency with this approach. There's no good general substitution principle to associate with, um, with FA. And to, to sort of drive this home, imagine we have some type, gamma proves A, and some substitution into F gamma. There's no particular way to view gamma as being in the image of F. And there's even if it was in the image of F, there's no reason to assume that it's uniquely in the image of F somehow. And so there's no particular way to resolve this with the equations we have. And of course, this isn't quite as dramatic as uh, you know Nat becoming bool like I had on the slide a few, few times ago, but it kind of has the same impact. Basically, it means that when we have a lemma which uses F and then we move it to a different context to actually use it, we have to pay very careful attention to what's happening with our substitutions, and there's a real chance that the substitution will just get stuck, and uh, the, the shape of our lemma will actually change on us. So I will note that it is sort of uh, consistent to just accept this as is and move on. We can, we can fulfill the, uh, the letter of the law, if not, not its spirit, and make this, uh, this connective respect substitution by just having it carry around the substitution that it didn't know how to resolve. This works. And it's uh, it's relatively simple, and it scales to a bunch of modalities. You just add more things that act on context. And in some very special cases, we can sort of arrange that this has a more uh, comprehensible syntax. So I have a citation here to a paper on guarded recursion, which uses these delayed substitutions with the later modality. And the, the result in syntax is reasonable. But normalization fails. And because of this, type checking isn't really decidable. And uh, sort of even more problematic for me is that as you add more modalities, you basically have to start reasoning about substitutions as if you were working externally. So it, it sort of fails both the, uh, the implementability and the usability fragments of my criteria. But let's talk about why normalization fails, because it's instructive. So the failure of normalization is really tied in with the failure of the substitution lemma, because basically any time we can factor a substitution into F gamma, um, that gives us another way to simplify FA when we apply a substitution to it. So here I sort of have the, the setup we have. Uh, a is, uh, oops, that should say FA, um, is in the context F gamma. And we have a way to uh, resolve the substitution FA substituted with gamma. Namely, we can push this bit through and leave this bit delayed. There's no reason to assume that there's a unique substitution. Um, I suppose there's always at least one where we take gamma prime to be the identity. 
But uh, without a unique possible solution, we have many different reductions that we can apply. And thus, there's no reason to expect that there will be normal form, like unique normal forms. So this, this does offer a sort of potential way out, though. So maybe we can't have a unique factorization, but maybe we can have a, a best choice of factorization, or perhaps a worst possible choice that we can always use. And so more technically speaking, we can ask for an initial factorization, um, factoring each gamma into an eta and then L gamma. And if you require this for all contexts and you require this for all substitutions, this is a fairly recognizable categorical property. We're asking that F be a right adjoint on the category of contexts, and in particular that it has this left adjoint L. Okay, and let's, let's try and chase through some of the consequences here. So we can specialize our earlier rule using delayed substitutions to use eta. So we have a universal delay now. And the really interesting thing is that when we choose such a universal delay, we obtain a general substitution principle. So if we apply gamma to uh, A with this uh, universal delay, well, we push it through into uh, there. And the naturality of eta allows us to commute gamma past the eta and thereby push the substitution all the way onto A. So we now have a way to actually move substitutions past the modality, just like we want to. And uh, we can play the same game with introduction and elimination. The, uh, the chasing through the, the, the calculations is a little bit more tiresome. I, I've produced it here. Um, it factors basically through the two observations. One is that uh, adjoints descend to slices. And the other is that we always have a pullback and uh, post-composition um, adjoint. But the important bit is not really these, uh, these calculations. The important bit is the rules that we get out of the bottom here. And you'll notice that these are almost transposition-like rules telling us how to introduce and eliminate modalities. Namely that uh, if we want to prove f of a, then we can modify the context with the left adjoint and prove a, and we can undo this operation as an elimination principle. And there is something to, uh, to observe here, which is that after we've produced all of these uh, new uh, formation, introduction, and elimination rules, we don't actually strictly use F on context anymore. Uh, we're just using L everywhere. And so we can just drop uh, the need for F to act upon context. Of course, that's sort of how we got here, but it's, it's not necessary to express the rules. And this leads us to the notion of a dependent adjunction or a dependent right adjoint. So a, a dependent adjunction on a model of type theory consists of a functor on the category of context L, and then a map on types, which sends a type in context L gamma to a type in context gamma. And we require that it comes equipped with a natural bijection that I've, I've written here, which expresses exactly the introduction and elimination rules that I was describing. And we can consider type theory extended with one dependent right adjoint, or DRA. Um, this was introduced in a paper by Birkdal et al. Uh, they didn't give it a name as far as I can remember. So I, I took the liberty of just uh, choosing dependent right adjoint type theory or DRAT vocalize. And so this is sort of our, our next uh, putative uh, solution to the, the problem of modal type theory so we can consider. And the first thing to notice is that it's still pretty easy to cook up models of DRAT. Um, we can refine the theorem we had earlier with uh, the uh, calculus of delayed substitutions. And instead of just asking for a, a map F, which preserves display maps and pullbacks, we're just asking for a right adjoint, which preserves display maps. The, the pullback preservation is now automatic. And uh, I'll note that uh, the preservation of display maps in typical semantic cases where you're considering all small families, uh, it, it's, it's often automatic. With presentable categories, you can sort of wiggle out of it with uh, an argument about accessibility. And I'll also note that the examples we started with, with global sections and later and all of this stuff, these are also DRAs. As a rule of thumb, when something is a right adjoint, it will shake out to being a DRA somehow. Uh, so on the previous slide, uh, 18, or do we still have the background assumption that, that F is Lex? Uh, no, at this point, we can safely okay. drop that assumption. Um, F is an operator on types and not context anymore. Right. So it, it's harder to chase down what it would mean to be Lex. OK, got it. Yeah. I, I will note that there's a certain uh, adjoint-esque argument to show that F satisfies axiom K, which is one version of being Lex in type theory, or a very weak version of that property. Uh, da, da, da. 
OK, so uh, let's talk about the bad news. Um, if you'll remember, we started all of this off because our formation rule uh, was something like f gamma proves f a. And we made all this fuss about the fact that it doesn't have a substitution principle because not every map into f gamma can be uniquely factored, da 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 da. Well, the thing is, we've actually kind of painted ourselves into exactly the same corner, but at least this time we've moved the problem to the elimination rule. So if we look at the elimination rule again, we'll notice that it still has the same problem. If, if we have a substitution into L gamma, we don't necessarily know that that substitution is in the image of L, and there's no real way to push it upwards. If you look at this semantically, it corresponds to the fact that um, while it's certainly the case that this is natural in gamma, we really wanted it to be natural in all of the, the context, and that's sort of nonsensical to ask. There is a workaround, um, which is that in DRAT, there just aren't that many ways to map into L gamma. In fact, there's basically two ways to map into L gamma. You can use weakening to forget something sitting in front of L gamma, or you can use the functorial action. And if you think very hard and you prove some syntactic lemmas, you can say, well, the original rule isn't stable under substitution, but if I just manually close it up under weakening, then it will be stable under substitution. And the result is this uh, somewhat aesthetically displeasing rule that just bundles in a bunch of weakening at the beginning. And this, this works, uh, mind you, but there's sort of a major downside, which is that it relies heavily on the particular properties of the syntactic category. So if you change F or you change other aspects of your calculus, those proofs have to be redone, and the rule has to be reimagined. So that being said, the calculus is completely possible to implement. Uh, I did so with some collaborators, and others have done so in the context of clocked type theory. It's, it's actually quite pleasant to use, uh, despite the somewhat ugly elimination rule. The major downside is that coming up with these elimination rules, proving that they're valid, it's, it's a lot of work. Some improvements have been made in the context of one modality. But as soon as you have more than one modality at a time, I don't believe anyone knows how to include uh, an elimination rule that actually has good behavior with respect to substitution. It's also unsatisfying in a pretty serious way to depend on how the syntactic model works. It means that if we try and use this as a, an internal language and we start adding constants to make it more faithfully reflect the model we care about, pretty quickly we can actually break the substitution principle, which is not something that happens uh, in normal models of type theory, in normal internal languages. So uh, what do we do about this elimination rule? Um, well, we can play the same game that we played with the formation rule. We can ask that there's an initial factorization. And uh, a naive guess would then be that we're just going to ask that L be a right adjoint as well as a left adjoint. But in fact, we can make a slightly sharper um, assessment here. Notice that if you have a map from delta to L something, you have a map from delta to L1. In our original setup, mapping into F, everything had a map into F1 because F1 was the terminal. In this case, however, it's actually not a trivial obligation to have a map into L1. There will be contexts that just don't have such maps. And when you don't have such a map, there's really no reason to require that substitutions out of it factor. They, they can't arise in the substitution problems we're considering. So instead, what we can do is not ask that L be a right adjoint, but a parametric right adjoint. And I've reproduced the definition here. So a functor is a PRA, parametric right adjoint, exactly when the induced map on slices over the terminal is a right adjoint. So in particular, the left adjoint applies not just to objects, but objects together with a map into this functor uh, applied to the terminal. And you can take the assumption of a parametric left adjoint, I suppose, existing, and rephrase the transposition rule, and you'll end up with something like this. So uh, two, two premises to consider here. The first is this substitution row, which goes from gamma, our context that we're working in, to L1. And the second is the application of the parametric left adjoint to gamma and rho. And notice that it does need to be applied to both of them. This is a functor that operates on slice categories. And uh, we have to do some wiggling with A here to get this to work out. Now, I think this rule is a little bit inscrutable. So while you may believe that it's formally equivalent, I think it's worth maybe taking a step back and trying to work out why this is a reasonable rule to consider. So I'm going to make the rule go away now, sorry. Uh, first of all, some, some terminology. 
an exceptional dependent adjunction is exactly a dependent adjunction whose left adjoint is a PRA. So it, that's the, the situation we're in. I don't have a terribly good name for this situation, but they're pretty special, so exceptional. But there is an important class of things which are exceptional DRAs, and those are the things that behave like dependent products. So much so that you should sort of consider this to be the main instance. And I, I have here, you know, as a quick theorem, that for any closed type, the dependent product over that type corresponds to some exceptional DRA. And the rule that we were looking at becomes a lot more sensible if you sort of specialize to the case where F is the dependent product. Because in that case, the parametric left adjoint just projects from the slice category to the category of context. So that kind of vanishes. And a map from gamma into 1.c, this is the left adjoint applied to the terminal category or terminal context, this is recognizably just a term of type C. So what we're saying here is that if you give me a term of type C and a function from C to A, I'll give you back something in A. So this is uh, the application rule, uh, as we're familiar with it. And in fact, being a parametric right adjoint, the, the left adjoint being a PRA, is exactly what you need to wiggle the transposition elimination rule into an application rule. And so this gives us a way to sort of get a very cool syntax out of this. We can try and represent these substitutions row as uh, ticks, and they behave like certain substructural terms. And this is actually implemented in the um, clocked type theory. But it also sort of... Uh, gives us an idea why the PRA requirement is a reasonable thing to ask for. It's exactly what we need in order to make the elimination rule behave well and uh, make it behave like application. And uh, this is actually one nice thing is that this gives us a way to return to those earlier syntactic lemmas that we were proving. So what were we really showing when we were constructing these sort of ad hoc elimination rules? Well, we were showing that the left adjoint in the syntactic model happened to be a PRA. So if you investigate the proofs that are going on in these sort of earlier papers, you can see that they're precisely showing that you have a PRA on syntax. And the lemmas that we had to prove in order to make it work were exactly showing that that's what was going on. And this leads to uh, our third possible solution, which is a uh, Fitch TT proposed by myself and some collaborators uh, last year. And you take uh, type theory and extend it with as many of these exceptional DRAs as you want. Uh, it, it scales to as many modalities as you want without additional syntactic arguments, so that's quite nice. And I conjecture that normalization and type checking are both uh, possible. They're at least true for systems which look similar. And there's one interesting observation to make here, which is that a model of Fitch DT is exactly a model of DRAT, where the left adjoint happens to be a, a parametric adjunction. And because we can show that on the syntactic model, the left adjoint is a parametric adjunction, the syntactic model of DRAT is a model of Fitch TT. And Fitch TT is a model of DRAT because of, uh, well, it's an extension of the system. And so if you sort of chase through what this means, you can work it out to saying that Fitch TT is a conservative extension of DRAT. So even though you're adding these, this PRA structure, it doesn't give you any extra provability power. It just gives you a better behaved system. I think that the uh, the downside of this approach, though, is not so difficult to spot, which is um, how many modalities in reality are right adjoints to start with, and then how many of those right adjoints are essentially part of an adjoint triple. Uh, a PRA is not that far away from a right adjoint, so it, the, the distinction hinges on whether or not it preserves the terminal object. So the answer is not zero. So in the, the case of uh, guarded recursion, both box and later fit into this ex exceptional DRA framework but it's definitely cutting down on the number of things we can talk about. It's also quite dissatisfying to me that we're requiring the existence of three functors, and then we can talk about exactly one of them as a, as a type at least. Uh, so I want to talk about a system which weakens these assumptions a bit, but before I do that, I need uh, some notation so that things, uh, I, I need to stop picking single letters to represent all the new things I'm introducing. So we're going to work with a, a mode theory, which is going to be a, a two category. It'll sort of abstract the situation that we're dealing with here. So the zero cells are called modes, one cells modalities, and the two cells represent natural transformations between them. The modes are not important and will be essentially ignored. The important bit is the modalities and the two cells, and I'll use mu, nu, et cetera, 
for the uh, two cells or for the uh, modality, excuse me. So by requiring that these things form a two category, we always have composites of modalities and identities. And uh, we'll also have this new notation for modal types in their left adjoints. So I'll write uh, this angle brackets spaceship type thing for modal types. And I'll write this postfix dot brackets move for the left adjoint. And the, the two categorical structure is going to appear in the syntax because henceforth we will assume that um, the left adjoint is going to be a two functor. So in particular, locking by the identity is the identity and locking by a composite is locking by a composite. And you'll notice that I'm going to slip up a lot and use uh, the, the phrase locking to describe uh, this left adjoint. Historically, the notation for this was a, a little lock symbol, but I've taken to using the, um, the brackets recently. OK, so let's retreat from the, the very powerful elimination rule that doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, well-behaved models. So can we weaken dependent adjunctions to arrive at something that's a little bit more workable instead? Excuse me for a moment. So the weakening proceeds by splitting things up into two separate bits. So first, we'll add a judgmental structure, which represents the, the right adjoint. But instead of having a type which precisely captures it, we'll add a much weaker structure that weakly internalizes this new judgmental structure. And it's these two things together that I call a weak dependent adjunction or a weak DRA. So the judgmental structure representing a right adjoint, it, it comes in the form of modifying context extension. And I've, I've written out the two rules for it. So the first is that instead of having normal gamma dot A, we now have gamma dot mu A. And notice the distinction here between the angle brackets, which represent modal types, and the parentheses, which represent this modalized context extension. So the universal property of this precisely says that a map into gamma dot mu A consists of a map into gamma and a term of A, but now with the uh, the context restricted by mu. And uh, chasing this through, we end up with a weakening substitution and a variable rule. And right, there's uh, two typos on this slide. There should be a left adjoint here, and that should be a delta. Sorry for that. OK, I, I want to uh, point out two things. The first is that if we restrict ourselves to sections of this structure, we, we, um, we notice that sections of weakening precisely correspond to terms of A in the restricted context. And since uh, locking by the identity is the identity functor, this generalizes what we have normally. Um, yes, it, it, uh, it recovers normal context extension exactly by choosing mu to be the identity. So now we want a type which weakly internalizes this, uh, this new form of context extension. And the formation and introduction rules for it are going to be exactly as they were for DRAs. There'll be these transposition style operations. The, uh, the difference is going to be in the elimination rule, which is the horribly scary looking one. Uh, this is going to reflect the fact that uh, it only weakly captures it. And there's a, a much nicer semantic way to understand what this is doing. The formation and introduction rules give us a substitution, which goes from mu a to id mu a. So here it's going from a modal annotated variable to an identity annotated modal type. And what this elimination rule says is that this map is anodyne. So if we're mapping into a type, these two, uh, two contexts are equivalent for our purposes. If you're a little bit more syntactically minded, you can also see this as a sort of pattern matching, that if you have m naught, which is of modal type, you may assume that it's of the introduction form when constructing M1. But again, uh, th this, this is much harder for me to remember, and I find that uh, weakly inverting the substitution is a much nicer sort of mental model to have. And this seems like a good story. Um, weakly internalizing things by having a certain map be anodyne is quite typical in type theory. Uh, there's a slight downside, though, which is that it doesn't handle nested modal types. If we have mu mu a, 
then we can apply the elimination rule once, but we can't apply it twice because we don't really have anything to manipulate a mu annotated mu modal type. And the solution here is to just generalize the elimination rule so that we can do exactly that. And uh, from the perspective of which maps we're forcing to be anodyne, we have a slightly more general version where we've replaced identity with new. And we're just going to ask that that be anodyne instead. Uh, I refer to these as crisp induction principles, which is a, a term that sort of outlived its, uh, its intuition because it, it used to refer to what things you could do with crisp variables, but now, of course, we don't exactly have crisp variables. Now we can render this being anodyne again as a pattern matching rule. And I'll just say that the distinction that we have from what was there earlier is exactly the bits that I've highlighted here, that you, you sprinkle in a few news instead of the identity. And in this context, I, I like to refer to new as the framing modality. But uh, with it to hand, we can prove the desired thing, which is that nested modal types correspond to modal types of the composite. Uh, if you like, the structure that you get out is some sort of pseudo-functorial map from modalities to types. And so we now arrive at our fourth possible solution, uh, MTT. And this was proposed by uh, myself and some collaborators in 2020. Uh, this slide can be roughly summarized as what I've been doing for much of my PhD. Uh, so you take type theory, you extend it with a lot of weak dependent adjunctions, you include all the possible crisp induction principles for modalities, and the result admits normalization. Uh, in fact, something slightly stronger is true. You can dial normalization to how many crisp induction principles you have. So include as many as you want, you'll always have normalization. The result can be implemented, and we've done so. Um, and if you want, you can even sort of rebase MTT on top of cubicle type theories, and you obtain something that has more of a uh, homotopical flavor. And crucially, it includes both of the examples we started with. Uh, in fact, with MTT, you could also just directly add the amazing right adjoint as a modality in its own right. So you, you don't necessarily need to factor through the box step there as well. OK, so the nice thing about MTT is that we don't have any messy syntactic requirements in order to include dependent right adjoints. Um, and typically, that's how we use MTT. We use it as a version of DRAT with better syntax. The models that we consider uh, in one categories tend to just be dependent right adjoints of some sort. And they ought to validate the stronger elimination rule, but we can't uh, model that nicely syntactically, so we don't have it. The plus side is that uh, the map that we're forcing to be anodyne then becomes an actual isomorphism. So it certainly has all the crisp induction principles. And so this is sort of summed up by this theorem and corollary. But the main thing is that uh, if you have a bunch of uh, DRAs, you can construct a model of MTT out of it. Uh, this raises what I think is a fairly interesting question, though. If everything that we care about is actually a strong uh, DRA or just a normal DRA, is it possible that weak dependent adjunctions are somehow equivalent under some additional assumptions? So a naive guess would be if you throw in equality reflection, do they become equivalent? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So I, I produced here a, uh, a sequence which is provable in DRAT and isn't provable within MTT. So even with equality reflection, you just can't fill this in. And the issue somehow boils down to the fact that you have a variable hidden behind a lock, and there's just no way to make this lock go away. We don't have a transposition rule, which allows us to pull it into a modal type in a premise. And the elimination rule doesn't let us get this out. And uh, since this is the identity annotated variable, there's nothing to be done here. We're completely stuck. Uh, it's an open question, and I think a somewhat interesting one whether every, this is true for closed terms. There is a, a similar result in Davies and Fenning showing something related for simply typed calculi. And it's definitely false for type theories that have infinitary products, but uh, I haven't yet figured out how to carry out the proof done in Davies and Fenning in the dependent case without getting uh, sort of swamped beneath a mess of details. The, the essential idea is that with closed terms, you can be clever and hoist uh, elimination principles out high enough that you don't end up in these stuck positions. 
I will note, however, that it is uh, that weak and uh, normal DRAs do coincide if our modality is already a right adjoint in the mode theory. So first of all, remember that our mode theory is a two category. There's a notion of an adjoint in any two category. And so we can perfectly well ask if our modality mu is a right adjoint. And in extensional MTT, internal right adjoints are dependent right adjoints. The, the proof hinges basically on the fact that two functors preserve adjoints. So the context operation associated with mu is a right adjoint. And this gives us enough properties to produce this, uh, this isomorphism that I've highlighted here, saying that if you restrict by mu, you can compose by the left adjoint nu and sort of push the, um, the left adjoint further and further along the context. And the consequence of this is that you don't end up in those stuck positions that I was describing before, because you can sort of resolve the adjoint or the, uh, the lock on the context. It's a fuzzy intuition, but the result is very useful in practice. And um, I also want to note a comparison between FitchTT and MTT, because they're both purportedly solutions to the issue raised by DRAT, uh, namely that the elimination rule is kind of ill-formed. So the following at least gives some way of relating them, which is that any nice model of FitchTT where the left adjoints preserve terminal objects is a model of MTT with both the left and the right adjoint. And I think there's a fairly clear takeaway from this, which is that if the left adjoint preserves terminal objects, you should use MTT with the richer mode theory. You simply get more features. If your left adjoint doesn't preserve the terminal object, you can go about mixing them. So uh, Evan Cavallo did this in his thesis in a particular special case. And I forgot to cite it here, but uh, Mike Schulman has had a recent preprint that sort of shows how to do this maybe in a more general way or a more systematic way. Now, there is one other thing that's worth mentioning in the context of MTT, even though it's a little bit of a tangent, which is type theories built around left division. This is a, sort of a different approach where instead of having the left adjoint just a formal context operation that sort of sits on each context, we can instead make it a sort of admissible procedure. So it'll go through the context and divide out each modality. This is almost as good as making all of your modalities internal dependent right adjoints, or sorry, internal right adjoints. It's a little bit of a weaker requirement though, because you just require that composition with a modality as an adjoint, not that the actual modality is an adjoint. So this has been used, but uh, I think the interesting thing to see that here is that the modalities being used are still weak DRAs. They're just weak DRAs whose left adjoint is particularly well behaved and has a good commutation rule with uh, context extension. Uh, more water. All right. So thus far, we've still been talking only about strong DRAs in our semantics. Everything thus far has been a normal right adjoint, and our syntax has just precluded us from taking advantage of that. How do we go about finding an actual weak DRA in the wild, as it were? And a slightly unlikely source of them comes from dual context type theories. So this is an entirely different family of type theories. Um, it was kicked off well earlier than 2001, but I think a quite influential source of them has been a paper by Fenning and Davies. And I have several other citations here that which, which we can talk about. And the key point that I want to get across here is that the syntax of dual context also contains a weak DRA. But even more interestingly, the sort of standard model of dual context type theories includes a weak DRA, which is not an actual uh, dependent right adjoint, which truly only models the weaker elimination rule. So let's get into it. Uh, we're following work here by Colin Wanziger from 2019. And this, this unwinds the stack quite a bit. Instead of asking for a universal factorization like we did when we started talking about DRAT, we won't ask for a universal factorization, but we'll ask for a chosen one. That uh, given a map into, uh, we'll require that each context has a distinguished map into F gamma. And substitutions between contexts are required to respect this chosen map. And we can represent it syntactically with this uh, dual context semicolon here. This is meant to represent that gamma is some big family equipped with a canonical projection onto F delta. And we can then produce a whole new family of judgments 
which use these dual contexts and lay, lay on top of the uh, single context uh, versions. And uh, what sort of things are substitutions between these dual contexts? They're maps which respect this division uh, between uh, the, the chosen map onto F delta. So there's kind of a nice categorical way to structure this, which is that the category of dual contexts and their substitutions should be a fibered category over ordinary contexts and ordinary substitutions. Um, we have, therefore, a Cartesian reindexing, which gives us a way of dragging back a uh, context to adjust to things that we change in delta. So if we extend delta by a variable, we can therefore produce a new uh, dual context. And we require that each fiber has a terminal object and that that's stable under base change. That corresponds to asking for delta semicolon one. And uh, dual contexts, of course, have their own notion of extending gamma by a variable. So all of this can be crystallized in an algebraic style, and it's uh, frankly quite painful. But the important bit is that it's a, a, a Cartesian vibration that we're working with here. And uh, following um, Wanziger's work, we're going to decompose our modality into an adjunction. So our goal here is to present a comonet. That's generally what you get out of um, dual context type theories. But it's sort of convenient to split it into an adjunction between single context and dual context. So our right adjoint takes something in dual context and gives us something in single context. Our left adjoint goes the other way gives us something from single context and gives us back something in dual context. And we can stitch together box in the way that you always get a comonad from an adjunction by applying the right and then the left. All right. So I want to point out that we can view a uh, dual context as a Cartesian vibration. And from that viewpoint, the operations, uh, we, we actually end up with an adjunction between context and dual context. We can take something in the base and pick out the terminal and its fiber, and we have the projection. And from this point of view, uh, one slightly nice observation is that extending delta and weakening gamma is precisely extending this entire dual context by some sort of modalized variable, just as we did in MTT. So this is the, uh, the reemergence of the weak DRA structure, and we're about to capitalize on it. But if you uh, you actually unfold what universal property this is supposed to have, you'll find that it's exactly the universal property that this has. So I now have a slide full of rules, but the good news is you don't actually really have to read any of them. Uh, you could just read the line at the top, which says that L is a weak DRA and R is a DRA. And the rules that I've produced here are the familiar rules for dual context, but they actually shake out to exactly this sentence. And uh, note that we actually don't include any uh, crisp induction principles um, in the style of MTT. It's just the normal elimination rule. And uh, this system, I think, was called adjoint type theory in uh, Colin's paper. OK, so here's our dual context type theory. And we can see that the weak dependent right adjoints are still present here. Namely, here's their, uh, their elimination rule. Here's their weak internalization, et cetera, et cetera. But the interesting bit is not that there's yet another type theory that has weak DRAs. Oh, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. I wanted to mention one more point, which is um, you'll notice that I've included the, uh, the DRA rule here, um, the, the bad transposition rule that we spent so much time trying to get away from. Why isn't that a problem for dual context type theory? Why, why haven't uh, people invented PRAs much sooner if this was an issue? Well, the, the trick is that. Um, the DRA here, its, its lock is a right adjoint because it's the right adjoint modality. So on context, it acts as a right adjoint. And in particular, it acts as a parametric right adjoint. And if we rephrase that using the, uh, the elimination rule for Fitch TT, we get exactly the standard rule that you see in dual context type theories, um, where instead of having requiring this to be empty, it's, it's gamma. So in fact, the, the Fitch GT rule shows up here as well, which is kind of nice. OK, pardoning the interruption, we can uh, use the relation between MTT and, uh, sorry, the, the inclusion of weak DRAs in dual context type theory to get a, a somewhat tight relation between dual context type theories, adjoint TT and MTT. Namely, it gives us an interpretation. And um, note that the interpretation is still useful. Uh, before I mentioned that with crisp induction, 
a uh, right adjoint modality is a DRA? Well, without crisp induction and without equality reflection, it's still a DRA, it just sounds the ADA rule. So you can interpret MTT into dual context type theory by deleting a few rules. And MTT after deleting those few rules is still quite usable. You still have all the properties that you expect. And in particular, you have essentially direct correspondences to all the rules in adjoint type theory. So if you look at what a model of one is versus what a model of the other is, it shakes out to exactly whether or not we ask that locking by the right adjoint is a Cartesian fibration or not. So if it is, it's a model of adjoint type theory. If it's not, it's only a model of MTT without some rules. And uh, the final point that I wanted to make is our one and only example of a weak DRA semantically that is not a strong DRA. And it comes from the, uh, the standard model of dual context, where you take a Lex functor, you form the gluing category, and you consider the Cartesian vibration of the gluing category over C. And uh, dual contexts are precisely objects of the gluing category. Single contexts are objects of C. And the sort of wrinkle that makes you only have a weak DRA, which is the interesting bit for us, is that display maps in the gluing category are not arbitrary maps. They're maps that come from D, the closed et al maps in particular. And so this, this distinction of what display maps we have in glue F mean that uh, the interpretation of L is only a weak DRA, even semantically, which is interesting. But uh, even better, it means that we can sort of combine our two results now, interpreting MTT into adjoint TT, interpreting adjoint TT into this model, and conclude that MTT without crisp induction can uh, internalize an arbitrary geometric morphism. Uh, and by the way, it does interpret the full thing if the induced commonad is it impotent. So at least if you're working with less it impotent commonads, you can just sort of fearlessly work with MTT, even if you don't have an actual left adjoint lying around. So um, this is reaching the end. Uh, this, this was sort of a long slog through many, many different modal type theories. But uh, stepping back, we can sort of see that all of the things we've looked at, with the exception of the delayed substitutions, basically structure their modalities using weak dependent right adjoints, perhaps with some additional bells and whistles to make the left adjoint behave particularly well. And as a consequence of this, a type theory built on weak DRAs like MTT can be interpreted into all of them. And there's, you know, there's an asterisk here. It turns out that not every type theory will include all crisp induction principles. So MTT minus minus, perhaps. Of course, I, I don't mean to imply that we should all be using MTT for everything. More what I mean to say is uh, that this is uh, placing some bounds on what functors we know how to internalize in this style. If everything is a weak DRA, uh, that's a, a somewhat concerning state of affairs because not every functor of interest fits into this framework. I will note that uh, the situation is not quite as bad as it might appear. Um, so you might think that this means that we need some sort of left adjoint functor anytime we want to internalize stuff. But uh, recently, Mike Shulman has, a, uh, has some result which shows that we can generalize the idea from the gluing model from adjoint type theory to a much more complicated and rich structure that allows us to sort of forge uh, left adjoints, even when they don't uh, precisely exist semantically. And uh, the conclusion slide, there's lots of open questions here that I'm happy to discuss. Um, we have some conservativity results. Uh, that are left open, as well as uh, normalization results that remain to be proven. Uh, I must admit, I'm not terribly eager to uh, carry out the proof of normalization for cubicle MTT, but uh, if someone is, uh, God bless, please, please feel free. Um, it's also unclear how we should go about adding modalities which are not weak DRAs, which don't satisfy axiom K, for instance. Um, this is left completely for future work, along with uh, models of a more homotopical nature. Uh, this this is a bit tricky because it's not clear how to rectify diagrams of higher categories, uh, even if we have a good procedure for rectifying higher categories. And of course, everything substructural is left alone here. All right, uh, I think that's it. Uh, great, thanks very much. Let's all uh, silently applaud the speaker. Well, it's very good that I have the silent applause emoji as well. Yeah, uh, and yeah, we have... Lots of time for questions. Anyone can just go ahead and unmute yourself.
So, uh, so I have a silly question to start maybe. So on around slide 25 or so, um, you were you were talking about how we can kind of think of um, all of these, um, yeah, uh, all these exceptional dependent adjunctions as a like as a uh, functions out of C, some fixed C, right? Um, so you said dependent. Uh, but this doesn't look dependent to me. And on the next slide, I was trying to, in my head. Um, Unify this with the the rule you had previously that had some stuff on the left. So I think what was going on is that the gamma there's a silent weakening that you dropped. Is that right on the second premise? Yes. So um, in the second premise, you should be applying the um, the left or the parametric left adjoint. It just so happens right. that when you're talking about actual functions, the uh, the adjoint there sends something living over. Um, gamma dot C or one dot C to just the, the base. So it, it's the forgetful functor, which is why you just see gamma here. So is there a version of this where A is actually dependent on C or? Um, in fact, I believe A is dependent on C because A here is occurring as F of A and F is exactly the, uh, the dependent product. Uh, so there is uh, some an unfortunate notational thing here, which is that I've chosen to write the dependent function with just the arrow because I haven't been using named variables throughout. Oh, okay. I think I, I've gotten you with a very bad notation. I understand. Here. Okay. No, no, no. I understand. Okay. <laughs> uh, In my yeah. defense, I think you're the one who taught me this notational convention. So, uh, yeah, I mean, hoisted by my own petard. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, I, I like to up the naivete of these questions, uh, which yeah, I already Carlo uh, was like, oh, I'm going to ask really naive question and ask really technical question. So you, you you just gave two examples of modalities, and they happen to be modalities that satisfy all these extra conditions that you talked about. Hey, can you give an example of a modality that doesn't satisfy those conditions, or just other examples of modalities? Um, do you have specific conditions that you want to eliminate? I, I can say that uh, in practice, the modalities that I work with a lot tend to be geometric morphisms between topi. So they'll come from some sort of con extension um, along a Lex functor. Okay. Uh, how to say this? I feel like I, I always ask the, can you explain this to a non-category theorist question? So the, I understand when you're trying to do synthetic geometry. I understand when you're trying to do synthetic domain theory, because these are computer science questions. And I can sort of say, hey, what if I don't care about category theory? So are there is there a way you can tell me, hey, this is a modality you might care about because you're a computer scientist or you're you know a mathematician or you're a programmer? Okay, Here, here's a more programmatic example, maybe. So let's say that you're trying to write uh, programs that modify data as it's received from input and produce it as output. And they're trying to do this almost in lockstep, so that as one bit of input is received, another bit of output is produced. Okay, so that's what a function NAT to NAT does, or, well, in this case, stream of NATs to stream of NATs. Uh, the issue is that there are lots of functions that don't have such a nice input-output behavior. And one thing we can do is use modalities to represent the consumption and production rates on various streams. So we can represent this function takes in two nats and produces three nats on each step or something like this using modalities. These are uh, called, I think, warps in work okay. by uh, Adrian Guado. This sounds similar to your uh, triangle modality or later modalities, yes. the one you had at the beginning. Does it have the same property? Does it have this good like triple adjoint structure? Uh, it doesn't have an adjoint triple in general, uh, because warps are a, a significantly more general sort of operation, but it does have the good structure of being a DRA, so we can include right. it. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I will end it now if, if you'd like, but I'd still like to hear an example of a modality that doesn't have the good structure. Uh, meaning something that doesn't fit into this framework. Yes. Oh, I have lots of those. Um, or at least I have more than I wish I had. Um, <laughs> okay, well, great. Yeah, the, the one that I think comes up the most is some sort of irrelevance modality. Um, and I think this is going to be a bit difficult to include because while it preserves the terminal object, it won't preserve equalizers. Um, 
Okay, irrelevance in the univalence sense, right? Where you sort of say, hey, I don't actually care about. Uh, I don't relevance. mean. I didn't actually mean propositional truncation. I meant some stronger sort of erasure type modality, um, which people do actually model using modalities. I don't think those will fit into this framework because um, if you take not on Booleans and identity on Booleans and you make them irrelevant in a very strict sense, they'll come out to be the same thing. So taking their equalizer gives you the terminal. And if you take their equalizer and then make it irrelevant, you'll get the initial object. So it, it just doesn't shake out to uh, preserve the equalizers. All right, great. Thanks. That helps. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, hi, Danny. Um, so I started using a uh, guarded cubicle Agda for this later modality. And uh, this using the box modality like this uh, is an alternative, right, to using the uh, uh, clock quantification there. So uh, am I going to be able to use this one instead soon in Agda? Uh, if you do, it is not going to be because I was the one hacking Agda, unfortunately. That's, <laughs> that's a little bit beyond my capacity. But I, I do think it would be interesting to be able to experiment with this. Uh, yeah, so historically, clocks give a, were introduced sort of for two reasons. Um, one, they're syntactically easier to handle than box. And two, they, they allow you to express different classes of guarded recursive programs because you can have multiple independent time streams. But uh, I think for the, the dependent type theory purposes, the real crux is that with clock quantification, it's much easier to have sort of ad hoc syntactic checks to uh, to force things to work out compared to with box. Okay. Thanks. I have another localized question. If you go ahead to like slide 32 or so. Um, so I think, I'm sure you said this on one of the slides a few later, uh, later than this, but I couldn't quite catch it. So, I mean, I guess there's some relationship between gamma dot uh, parentheses and gamma dot uh, angle brackets. Yes, indeed. Right. And the relation is the elimination rule. So you uh, you have a canonical map between them. You right. can always go from round things to pointy things, but you don't generally have an inverse. Um, having an inverse is equivalent to being a, a strong DRA. So for weak DRAs, you just have that this is sort of weakly invertible, that it's anodyne. Right. Now, what what if I don't have the id ah, thing on the so, right? So uh, everything is annotated by a modality, but it turns out that being annotated by id is exactly normal context extension. Oh, oh, okay. You don't have okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, right. It it's it turns out to just sort of be a a nice convenience. Right, right. So so this is kind of like the I mean. You know, I'm more familiar with like normal inductive types or something, right? Where you'll you'll have like instead in a non-extensional type theory, instead of saying there's an isomorphism between these two things, you'd kind of have a have a section. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. So it's a similar kind of condition, right? Yeah, and so if you look at the semantics for these things, you do realize it exactly with a uh, a lifting structure. Right. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, I had another question about what fits into the framework, which is, um, uh, do you know about uh, differential cohesion? Uh, not intimately, but I, I'm broadly familiar. Okay, so, but uh, how many of those modalities fit into this framework? <laughs> so everything except the leftmost one will go. The leftmost um, in cohesion or in differential cohesion? In in general, like the, 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 the sort oh, of- All of the leftmost ones. <laughs> it's it's always the the left adjoint which is not right adjoint to anything right, okay. that's going to pose an issue. 
Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, I think with some of Mike's uh, recent work, we can even get some of those left adjoints. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that I'll say something incorrect if I if I blithely speculate, but I believe that at least some of those can be directly included using his uh, his coherence construction to uh, sort of artificially produce left adjoints. I don't think so because they're not ah, okay. um, left exact. Ah, there we go. This was the thing I was afraid right. of. That they oh would yeah, yeah. The, uh, that the lex condition. Really, yeah, that's a much bigger problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Right. Well, maybe let's uh, just thank the speaker again.